Hey friends, my dog is taking a nap, so I decided I could create this video over chapter 11, section 2, Kingdoms of West Africa. The previous video talked about the Bantu migrations, and I emphasized how there isn't a lot of historical records which makes studying that part of Africa a little bit more difficult. But when we go to West Africa, we have kingdoms like Ghana, Mali, and Songhai, which we have more historical records. So we're better to kind of, we're better able to tell that story. So the kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai are shown here on this map of Africa. So um, in chronological order, you have the kingdom of Ghana first, Mali afterwards, and then Songhai. They all developed around the same location in the Niger River. And the kingdom of Ghana has its origins, we think around the year 400. And you sometimes this area, like, we think of 400, 476, the collapse of Rome as the Dark Ages, but um, that is only relevant to Europe at the time. So these civilizations of West Africa were actually thriving at the time then too. All were more or less um, on top of one another. Again, um, the kingdom of Ghana in red, the kingdom of Mali in yellow, and then the kingdom of Songhai in green all developed um, at the Niger River Again, geography being so important, there's a reason these civilizations developed here and not here in the middle of the Sahara. The Niger River was very important for their lifestyle. Again, this is actually very similar to, oops, go away. This is really similar to other civilizations such as the Indus River Valley, the Chin. They're all sustained by rivers. So too will the Niger River be so important for their um, life. The kingdom of Ghana ruled for the longest from about 400 to 1000 CE, so about 600 years in that area. Its capital was Kumbasala, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, salt and gold were two of the major um, sources of their prosperity too. And then one of the really incredible things really is by the 1030s, the Almoravids had actually introduced Islam to Ghana. Um, Islam took off in the uh, 8th century in Saudi Arabia here, and it had, we talked about its expansion um, all the way to the fringes of India, and it even um, went into North Africa, but then it also crossed the Sahara and made its way down to the kingdom of Ghana, where it was um, at first um, accepted, but later on um, embraced, especially during the Second Dynasty, when a series of um, rulers from the Kita Dynasty established the kingdom of Mali which lasted for about 250 years. Sunjata um, was the um, Kita um, prince and king who took over and expanded the territory to um, Mansa Musa, the wealthiest person in history, um, makes a incredible visit to Egypt and Mecca in 1324. I believe there were other um, Mali kings who had also made the Hajj or the pilgrimage in which they traveled literally across the Sahara Desert um, into Egypt first, and then down to Mecca, as many Mali kings uh, performed that. Um, tales of the wealth of Mansa Musa, who is again believed to be the richest person ever in history, fascinated Egyptians, and then later on, um, Europeans who began to see West Africa as a source of um, wealth. And that definitely did play a role too in the idea of coming down to West Africa and later on um, starting the Atlantic slave trade too. Um, for 250 years afterwards, the kingdom of Songhai ruled, and there was a really cool um, center called Timbuktu. Um, I've seen it pronounced different ways or spelled different ways too, which was one of the greatest um, leading centers of the world in terms of its um, madrasas or the Islamic schools. So scholars from all over the world came here, and it really became one of the leading centers in the world then um, today. But by the 1500s, Songhai will fall to armies from um, Morocco, from the north, and the West African kingdoms will be extinguished. Um, the North African states and what is now like Morocco had um, different types of uh, warfare technology, warfare technology like weapons, um, and this will reflect a theme in history. Um, technological developments will have a huge impact on who wins and who loses, and by the time that the armies in Songhai were facing Morocco, um, they had fallen too. Songhai was also an Islamic kingdom too, um, that's kind of captured over here by one of the rulers whose name was Askia Muhammad. And one idea for educators too, um, I did this just last year and it was it was pretty cool. Um, Mali today is a very 
um, impoverished uh, nation too. But uh, it's really kind of cool to think about what Mali was like at its zenith, um, the time at which something is most powerful or most successful too. So rather than kind of get the image um, of Mali, especially as kind of a kind of a um, difficult place in the world, imagine students thinking of of Mali not um, not with its problems of today, but with its grandeur of the past. It's kind of a cool way to think about that part of the world. One other quick thing too, um, here we have examples of three different mosques that are all built very, very differently. There was the mosque at Genet in um, Ma the kingdom of Mali then too, and it couldn't be built like the Hagia Sophia because the there were not the um, tools um, to create it. So people use their resources relevant to their geography. What's really, really cool about the mosque at Genet is it's used um, clay, mud, hardened together with the sun, and you use wood to kind of um, hold it together. I'm not exactly sure how it all entirely works. But here again, three different examples of mosques being built in different parts of the world. People have to use the resources that are available to them. We also had a separation between two other kingdoms in West Africa, the kingdoms of Ilaife and Benin down here. They did not come into contact with these um, kingdoms from my understanding. Um, so they were separate. So the kingdoms of West Africa were separate from the polytheistic kingdoms of the rainforest in this part of Africa than here. In Ilaife, we know that the leaders were known as Onis. There is also still a lack of resources, which makes studying these kingdoms a little bit more difficult. We don't have quite as much information about them too, which again kind of goes back to the um, thoughtful history should evoke lots of feelings, in this case, curiosity, like, you know, who was this king or what is this uh, illustration on this plaque then doing? So we have to rely on Indiana Jones to help learn more about that story. And by the 1200s, the kingdom of Benin ruled the coast those leaders were known as Obas. The relationships between the two kingdoms, even the, look how close they are, like right here and right here, is unknown. Um, and at its zenith, the kingdom ruled much of present day southern Nigeria, which today is the most populous country in Africa then too. So history builds and builds and builds. I wonder what happened in Ilefe and Benin to uh, create what would eventually be um, Nigeria then too. Um, our text also notes that slavery was prevalent prior to the European colonization amongst tribes of that particular area. And then on one final note then too, I think here just in the last video, we saw the connections between um, these African sculptures and art, and it influenced modern artists in Europe and the Americas to again go back to works of Picasso. We can see here how um, these art, um, art is inspired really from what was created in present day Africa at the time. Yay, Bruno slept through the whole thing. That's my dog, Bruno, that is. All right, bye friends.